for those that have, uh, of you that look at the news online, uh, I am not Diane Stott. She's in Africa somewhere doing great stuff with her new job from Purdue, and it's um, a mile long. National Soil Health Specialist, USDA, Natural Resources Conservation Service. I am not Diane. I am here. And it is really too close to the mic. She's in charge of international dirt. It's Whistler. It is. Is that better? Yeah. No. 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 This far. Right here? Yeah. yeah. Now you can hear. No, no. <laughs> is this better? Yeah. <laughs> Three inches away. Three inches. Three inches. Three inches away. Anyway, it really has been my privilege today to step in for Diane and meet our speaker, Nick Shankle. Uh, I, I have mispronounced. It's not spelled the way I sounded it out, but anyway. Uh, in just uh, a few minutes, I have learned that February is his birthday month, no, so we sang happy birthday to him. He grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio. The West Lafayette Library System wanted him, so in 1980 he moved to Lafayette, and it is our game. Uh, he is uh, very active in the Tippecanoe Arts Federation. There's a lot, in, and I think I'm quoting this verbatim. Well, a quote would have to be verbatim, wouldn't it? I think I'm saying this correctly. He does a lot of state library stuff. <laughs> so uh, his uh, title today for us is Cultivating a Community of Readers. So I want you to welcome me. To I'll speak loudly. Is that good? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I should put this side just in case you can see it. Um, some of you will know me from my WBAA book reviews that I've been doing for since the dawn of time. Uh, started with Roger Priest, and I've been there pretty much ever since. Go Roger. Um, David Bunty still wanders into the library periodically and, and talks to me, so we're still on good terms. And right now, Betty Carson. How, does anyone? Mm -hmm. No, you do. Excellent. The lovely, charming, and very talented Betty Carson is my producer nowadays, and I really enjoy doing this. Um, this is not all my talk either. Um, when I see people get up and they have like this much, I get like, oh my gosh, I get worried. <laughs> no, I thought he only had X amount of time, but he seems to be going on. Um, and since I since um, I, I do my um, since I do book reviews for WBAA, I wanted to bring a couple things just to share with you at the start of my talk um, to to give you an idea of what I've found interesting over the past oh, few years or so that, that you might find interesting, and I'll get through these rather quickly, I hope. Why did I bring that? <laughs> well, I did bring this one. I don't know why. I hope they serve beer in hell. Um, so there's one you might, I haven't even read this, but you might want to pick that up. Might, pardon me to the younger people. Um, and see what, I have no idea what that's about. Okay, well, that's cool. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Pete, someone slipped it in there and I foolishly picked it up. This one I do know and I like. This is part of a series. Um, and and I, I, just luckily, because of Canada, it's set in Quebec. It's an inspector in Quebec. He is kind of this frumpled kind of um, uh, guy that, that goes around. He's not a bumbling inspector, but he's, he's, he's used to living in small town Quebec. He goes around solving. Um, cases. Uh, this one is still life. Louise Penny is the person you want to want to remember, if if anything. And I just love the series. It's so Canada. You feel like you're in rural Quebec when you read this book. And the character is somebody you get to know and you love, and you want to meet him again and again. And the various odd little people that he goes through. 
I do. Fantastic. Yes, thank, you. thank you, Marvin. Oh, right. Yeah. 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 How's that? Good. Yeah. Okay. Is that good? Okay. Another couple books, and then I'll get into the heart of my my talk. Um, we were fortunate enough to get a grant from the American Library Association and the uh, National Endowment for the Humanities, and we so we had a series of programs for a year and a half called Muslim Journeys, where we read books and discussed books about the Muslim experience. Um, this is one of my favorites from that, from that collection. It's House of Stone. Has anyone read this by Anthony Shadid? Um, former, um, he, he passed away, unfortunately, covering the, the Arab Spring. Um, before, he, uh, before he left, um, he wrote this book, and it is House of Stone. It's about his journey as, a, as the kid of immigrants, and how many of us are... I am actually this. Well, I'm second generation. Um, he goes back to Lebanon, to a small town in southern Lebanon, because that's where his family came from, and he wants to kind of experience what life had been for his family. So he lives there for a year. He's a New York Times reporter, so he can afford it. He he lives there for a year and rebuilds the house that his family, and I mean his family, his extended family had owned for generations and fallen into disrepair. It's just a wonderful, touching story by somebody who can really, really write. He's a journalist. He really knows how to write. Um, and finally, let's do this one. Um, this is called Congo, the Epic History of a People. It's the one that, um, it's the most recent WBAA book review that I did, so it's, it's right there online if you want to listen to the extended version of it. I do like a four-minute review that you hear on the air, and then there's usually a much longer review on the internet because, as you would know, you can have all the time in the world on the internet. So I often go for like 15 or 20 minutes um, reading more extensively from the book and, and talking about it a little more. This is about a country that we've all probably heard of. It's now called the Democratic Republic of Congo. It's been called all kinds of things over its existence. Um, it is truly the story of a people, a very resilient people. Not having the best of times right now in Congo, but as the book points out, it was originally printed in Dutch, oddly enough, and then translated into all kinds of languages. It's an international bestseller, as they proudly tell you. Um, it's a story of a country that, that has gone from a pre-colonial, colonial, and now an independent stage, and has had incredible experiences, these people who, who have lived there for for these many, many millions of years, or at least thousands of years. Um, it's a beautifully written book, and it's the story of how this country has changed so much from the kind of really poor, backward country that it is now. It was not always that way. It was actually a thriving colonial outpost where everybody was actually doing quite well. And it's that part of the book especially is, is particularly fascinating to me. Well, building a community of readers, what, or cultivating a community of readers, actually, because we already have readers in, in the West Lafayette community. I'm sure many of you are, are part of that group. Um, but let me take you back just briefly to the turn of the last century, the turn of the 1900s, when the 1900s came in. Who remembers Andrew Carnegie? Everybody remembers. Good. Close enough. Um, Andrew Carnegie, who himself was an immigrant, right? A poor kid, literally a poor kid from Scotland, came over to this country, made lots and lots of money. He probably would have been a billionaire had he lived today, um, but he was a millionaire, which was, was darn good in those days. Um, as he got older, he decided that he didn't want to die with all this money. He wanted to, to give it out to other people and to other communities. And one of his one of his um, hallmarks are the public library program that he started in this country. Um, public libraries had been in existence before Andrew Carnegie. In fact, Lafayette's public library predates Andrew Carnegie, and West Lafayette's public library postdates Andrew Carnegie. Kind of weird. But in, in Indiana, which was his most rewarded state, Indiana has, Indiana has more Carnegie public libraries than any other state in the Union. Just a fantastic largesse to Indiana. But Andrew Carnegie didn't just give a community money. You had to write down why you wanted a public library. 
you had to write down how it was going to benefit the people in your community, and then you had to promise that you would fund that public library for eternity, or at least, you know, for a long time. And so he would give you $5,000, $6,000, $7,000 to build it, which at that time built you a pretty darn nice library. Otterbin had one. Um, Crawfordsville had one. I started out in Connersville, Indiana in my professional career. Connersville had one. Uh, they're, they're sprinkled across Indiana. Um, some of them are still in existence. But the key thing that Carnegie saw was that the community has to support this thing. I may give it to you in the sense of I'm going to provide the, the funding and I'm going to actually um, tell you how I think you ought to build it, but then you're going to fund it. You're going to raise local monies to fund it. That was revolutionary across most of the country, certainly for Indiana. And so ever since Carnegie's time, we've had this kind of... Uh, Cross this cross community agreement that public libraries are something the whole community is going to support. But I think it goes it goes both ways. If the community is going to support the public library, the public library has to support the community as well. One other little anecdote that may surprise you it surprises a lot of people and it shouldn't to learn that Indiana is consistently for the past 10, 15 years. Indiana has consistently been one of the top five states across the nation in terms of public library use. More people use public libraries in Indiana than almost any other state in the union. New York is very big, Illinois is very big, Utah is very big, and number one, I'm proud to say, number one is Ohio. Ohio is consistently the number one user of public libraries in the country. But Indiana is always number two, number three, sometimes we slip to four, we're usually two or three. So thank you, Indiana. Um, people here use their public libraries. And why cultivate a community of readers? How many people think the book is dead, for instance? How many people think that the internet uber all us, um, that Google, I can Google anything that I ever want to know and it'll be on Google, um, it, it, we don't need print, we don't need video, this thing is going to go away pretty soon. I, only lately I have heard, I have seen articles in places like the Atlantic Magazine and the New York Times huh, um, telling us that, oh my gosh, no, wait a minute, the book, the book still seems to be around. We still seem to be reading stuff in books. And Lord knows you're going to read on the internet. If you pull out your phone and you pull up a website thanks to Google or thanks to Yahoo or thanks to any of those other wonderful places, you're probably going to read it. We haven't gotten to the point yet. We haven't, we haven't completed the cycle where we go back to oral communication, which was our original way of passing information, right? Passing information, passing stories, passing what happened. We used to do that orally. Before there was a written language, before there were books, before there was papyrus, we talked about it. Well, now we seem to be going back to that, interestingly enough, because we're, we're, we're hearing so much stuff coming to us orally um, from someone telling us. But we're not there yet. We're still reading. And why do we read? I think we read, and, and you know this stuff, we read because we want to learn, we want to live outside of ourselves, the, the Gamache book, for instance, the Inspector Gamache book, for instance, and it's how we prompt our dreams. It's how we think about and plan out the future. It's how we, we see what is happening elsewhere in the world. How are we cultivating that community of reading, if you will? Um, we're doing it with print. We're doing it with e-books. And we're doing it with audio and visual resources as well. Our West Lafayette Public Library um, boasts a collection of over 147,000 print books. Uh, it would be nice to hit 150,000. I don't know if we, because we take out almost as much as we put in anymore. But it's, round numbers, we're at 150,000 books. We are checking out, if you count everything that we check out, we're checking out about a quarter of a million items every year. And as I like to say, most of that comes back. There, there, is, there is a little seepage, kind of like what happens that we don't get back, but more or less, 250,000 250, items check out, almost all of those come back. That's a lot of stuff. <coughs> Plus, we have nearly 21,000 e-books, thanks to our consortium, 
Um, and that circulation, while it is important, we're circulating maybe seven, eight thousand ebooks every year. And when you circulate an ebook, it simply means that you check it out onto your e-reader, and then after three weeks, it disappears. You don't actually return it, um, but it, you lose access to it. So it's still a library kind of kind of thing. And I think we are up to. We also now provide free musical downloads through Freegal and free streaming music through Freegal, and we're that's in the that's actually surpassing the ebook circulation. Interestingly enough, I think we're going to be over over eight thousand in our music downloads by the end of this year. Um, so we may actually exceed the um, the reading downloads. Anyway, circulation is doing great. I know the TCPL are our friends across the river have an equally strong circuit. It's bigger than ours. It's a bigger area that they serve. They're doing very well as well. We purchase nearly $50,000 worth of books every year, which is a lot of stuff. <laughs> and something that we do that not a lot of other libraries do, and it's, it literally is thanks to you all, we also add in kind an awful lot of books, videos, and CD music that you all are kind enough to give to us you probably think you're giving it to us for the Friends of the Library book sale, and indeed much of it goes there. But we skim off, I used to say we select, but you know, we're skimming off the cream of the crop that we think you want to then check out. So it's an incredible, all ages, all interests, all, all, all ethnic backgrounds, it's just incredible. Um, increasingly, we're cultivating that love of reading outside the library as well. We actually tried to have kind of a, a out of library experience in this very room several years ago. It was an absolute disaster. I think we had three, well, not absolute. We had three people come um, after we spent several hours using these very tables and putting books on. It was, one, it was a wonderful trial event, didn't work. What does work is taking, and again, literally hundreds of books into Westminster, into Cumberland Point, into Friendship House. Those are the three retirement communities we serve. Um, we do that on an every other week basis. It, it, some of you may be coming to, does anyone come to our Westminster is the most popular one. We circulate an incredible number of books. Um, our library staff take recommendations, take requests, bring those the next time they're there. We have a, a drop-off bin in Westminster so you can drop stuff off in between so you don't have to hold on to it, but you can. But if you want to drop it off early and we come out and get that. This has proven to be an incredibly popular, it's kind of our version of the bookmobile without a bookmobile. We have a van and they schlep the stuff from the van into Westminster <laughs> or into Cumberland Point or into Friendship and then they schlep it back out. Very popular. We've just added program at Richfield Apartments. Does anyone know? Many of you probably know where Richfield. We're working with Cumberland School faculty to help the parents and especially the kids there with after school programs. So we're going there every other Thursday, I think. Beth would know. We're going there regularly as well and doing pretty much the same thing. We slept in a bunch of books. We talk with the kids and the parents. They can check stuff out. They can keep it until we come back. This going out and bringing the library to you in a very personal way has worked. It seems to work really well in this city. Um, we go to uh, the West Lafayette Farmers Market regularly. We go to Global. Fe we are a big part of Global Fest. We're at the Mostly of the Arts in August downtown. Um, it's just an incredible opportunity for us to get out there in the community. And of course, and I want to mention too, that thanks to um, NCHS, we have uh, funding to put out two more, we're going to try to make it into three, two more large book returns throughout the West Lafayette community so that you'll be able to bring stuff on your schedule, you'll be able to drop stuff off and not have to worry about is the library open or not. One other um, exciting thing that we're doing in, in kind of uh, not in, in, in cooperation with that in a way, is our Little Free Library. How many of you know about Little Free Libraries? There's, there are two in West Lafayette right now. There's one in Lafayette that I know of. Um, it's literally, it looks like a big oversized birdhouse. 
It's on a post, and it literally is take one, leave one. The idea is you don't check it out. Oh, my God. You don't check it out. You simply, you bring what you think other people might be interested in reading. You put it in this little free library, and other people in your neighborhood are welcome to take stuff out. It's working really well at New Chauncey Housing Inc. down on Littleton Street. They were the first ones to work with us on this. Um, we got excited about it. They got excited about it. We got together, and by golly, it happened. Um, there's one up on Rose Street near the Happy Hollow entrance. We're working with the Purdue Building Technology class to develop a whole bunch more. And we've talked to the West Lafayette Parks Rec folks. They're, they're happy with this. So in the spring, and I don't know what spring means, but sometime in the spring, you'll see little free libraries popping up in the West Lafayette Park system. And we are going to help foster that get along. Thank goodness you don't have to check it out. You don't need your library card for that one. So all you have to do is stop by, take something. When the spirit moves you, you can put something back in. It's a wonderful program. It started just five years ago nationally. If you go to the internet, if you go to the Google and type in Little Free Library, um, you'll get this incredibly beautiful, splashy web page. There's a map showing where many of them are. It's gone international now. Um, really a marvel. It's a way of getting books to the people or getting you ready access. You can put one up in your front yard if you want to. There's no, I guess you should check with Dave Buck. But you can put one up pretty easily, or Cindy Murray, um, check, check before you put it up. But it's a great way for neighborhoods to get involved and to share ideas and to share books with each other. A um, couple of other things. Where did I, oh. I know I don't have enough of these, so if, but if you can share, that would be fantastic. Um, and I'm going to hopefully remember to take this. Don't let me walk out with it, but I'll put a few. Um, one of the popular things we do for kids is called tumble books. And when I say popular, literally we have thousands of these check out every month, except in the summer, which surprises me, because we always figured the summer would be the most popular time. We know that teachers push these in the school. And, which is fantastic. It's, a, it's an online program, absolutely free. All you need is a computer and computer access. You can use it on just about any device now. And it pops up little books. There's a little Tumblr guy who tumbles across the page for you. You pull up a book, you read it at your speed. You can set it to auto-read, auto and so it kind of pushes you along. Or you can read it at your speed, and you remember the old film strips where, it would, where you had the click your way through. You can do it that. It's, it's much more sophisticated. But you can do it that way, or you can set it on auto speed and let it go. It's fantastic for kids, and I wouldn't be surprised if a few adults were using it, too. It's meant for kids, but we all know kids' stuff does well with adults. This is our ebook collection, or at least it's the front page of our ebook collection, which, of course, is online, so I had to print this off, and it doesn't look nearly as nice as it does on the internet page, but that's what happens when you print stuff off of the internet. Um, it's called Overdrive. We're a member of the Indiana Digital Download Center, and yes, I was part of deciding that name, and I'm sorry I ever agreed to that name. But what you need to know is Overdrive. Um, if you go to the West Lafayette Public Library page and you click on ebooks, it'll, it'll let you go right in. All you need is your library card, and whatever password you come up, and please come up with something you can remember. Um, and you'll be able to download ebooks till the cows come home. Um, you can keep them for three weeks. You can put holds on them, in which case you'll be notified that you have a book waiting for you, and then you can go to the internet site and download it. It's really cool. Um, and of course, we have audio books. We also have um, just regular print books, if you will, that you read. And I must say the print books are more popular than the audio books, which is, continues to be interesting to me. And finally, from my pass out stuff, we just started this literally three weeks, two weeks ago. It's called Wowbrary. I love that. It's called Wowbrary, and it's actually spelled that way. Um, it's, it's, it's a program that allows you to see every week, Saturday morning, about 12.05, you will get a download from, you'll get an email from Wildberry 
which will tell you, as it says, the top choices for this week. What they do is, is go through our online catalog, they scour it, as they like to say, and they pull out anything that's new, put it together, and this is paper, obviously, but it's, it comes to you on the internet. Um, and it is linked up with Amazon, which is interesting. And you can place a hold on the book, in which case, you know, you'll be the first one or the second one to get it. Happy Valentine's Day, Curious George is probably already, I don't know how many holds back out already. Um, it does books, it does video, it does music. Um, and we had AC, the first week we did this ACDC happened to be, somehow we added an ACDC out, CD album, and it ended up as the number one item on our list. Wow Brewery has their own algorithm as to what shows up on top. And we were all like, wow, really? <laughs> um, and I, because this time I noticed that The Book of Life is big, Lucy is big, the movie, and then Happy Valentine's Day, Curious George. Um, if nothing else, it shows you the variety of stuff that your West Lafayette Public Library receives. And as I said, you can click on it and borrow it, uh, which means put a hold on it immediately, or you can read more from the Amazon site, or you can uh, just enjoy the pretty pictures, which is sometimes what I do. Well, finally, let me make note of a couple of things that I think are most exciting about what we've been doing in the, in the past couple of years. Um, I mentioned our ongoing fall and spring book fairs, which continue to be an incredible opportunity. We have been recycling, I don't know how many, we might, who knows how many, hundreds of thousands of books we have recycled back into the community, thanks to you. And we've made some money on the slide, which is not a bad thing. Um, that's, a, that's a definite plus for your public library. Um, how many know what PDA, I know you know what PDA is, but what is PDA when it comes to libraries? Does anyone? Public uh, display. That's and we have that. Um, you can occasionally walk into the library and see public displays of action going on. But what it actually, but in terms of libraries, um, the PDA means something else. It's it's uh, it's. No, I'm going to forget now. Um, <laughs> Patron-driven acquisitions. My wonderful colleagues in the academic library world. Um, are, are the ones who, who came up with this. And academics, how many academics do we have in the room, I know. Um, <laughs> academics love these, uh, to me, kind of odd, bizarre names. Anyway, it's patron-driven acquisitions. It works, and I love the PDA, because that's such a wonderful, it's so unlibrary-like. People don't think of libraries as places to go and make out, but, but it happens. Uh, it happened and since there have been libraries, and it will happen, I'm sure, way into the future. Um, PDA in terms of libraries means public determined acquisitions. Our call, one of our colleagues at Purdue University, Suzanne Ward, does anyone know Suzanne? Um, she's a librarian at Purdue, um, literally wrote the book on this topic. Purdue has been doing this for about 10 years, so she has 10 years of this wonderful data. We've been doing it for a little over a year, so we're beginning to get data. What Suzanne found and what intrigued me and what I am now a, an apostle about this to the Indiana Library community is that if you select a book, if you tell us, gee, I'd like to read such and such, we'll buy it now with PDA. The idea is that we will buy it automatically. We're not going to ask you, well, why should we buy that? Um, where did you read about it? Does it have any any good, you know, reviews. No, no, no. We're just going to buy it. We're going to, you'll be the first one to get it because you requested it. We'll then put it on the new bookshelf probably. And Suzanne's research and our experience confirms that if you suggest it and we buy it, it's much more likely to check out several times than if we, in our august wisdom, decide that this is something good to buy. Um, it's, it's, which is why librarians have kind of trouble with this. A lot of my professional folks go, oh, oh, oh. Um, but it's true. If you select something, probably other people want to read it too. Who knew? Um, we kind of knew this because of all the stuff that we add to our collection thanks to all those donations that we get. And obviously we're not going to add them if nobody's going to read them. Usually we get those donations because you've read it, 
and you're finished with it and you just want to pass it on. Sometimes we get it because you got it and you, you know, it was a birthday present and it's like, well, I don't know why anybody thought I would want that. But generally, you've read it, you like it, you're giving it to us, we put it in the collection, by golly, it checks out. Well, PBA is the kind of formal way of doing that. We're up, we're doing about 30, 38 a month of uh, the PDA requests, and I'm hoping that boosts as time goes on. Um, working really well, and as I said, it's really surprising the library community, and both Suzanne Ward and I are doing programs across the state on this now at, at conferences, and people have these really skeptical looks when they come in because, like, well, I don't know. Um, doesn't mean that librarians are going away, by the way. There's still a big role for librarians because what people select, we, you know, we may have somebody selecting tons of books on World War II.